Vice Chancellor Professor Pandit, Dean Professor Matu, uh, dear friends, uh, I'm truly delighted to be back in JNU uh, and very privileged uh, to uh, be invited to deliver the Professor Hilda Nath Kunzru Memorial Lecture. As you all know, uh, he was the founder of the Indian Council of World Affairs that is now closely associated with the Ministry of External Affairs and where suddenly students of my generation of JNU spent a lot of our time. Uh, he was also responsible for starting the Indian School of International Studies that became SIS in JNU. Uh, where I did my MPhil and PhD. So uh, it is only appropriate that on this occasion, uh, I share thoughts uh, with all of you on Bharat and the world. Let me start with my own understanding of what is Bharat. It actually has multiple symbolisms in different domains, economically, uh, we could be speaking about an Atmanirbhar Bharat that has a connotation of a certain resilience, uh, a certain self-sufficiency, a contribution, or a talent that is uh, expressing itself. Developmentally, today, when we speak about Bharat, it also implies a commitment to create an inclusive, just, and fair society where no one is left behind. And that is actually, in many ways, the true test of development. Politically, Bharat is a statement of independence. It is a declaration that India engages the world, that when India engages the world, it doesn't have to be done necessarily on terms that are set by others. Our objective in that engagement is to let our own personality and innate qualities come out. And then there is, of course, the cultural aspects of Bharat. Here we could be speaking about our thinking, our traditions, our heritage, and our practices. But moving beyond the descriptive uh, to the analytical, where international relations is concerned, Bharat also means being a civilizational state rather than just a national polity. It suggests a larger responsibility and contribution, one that is expressed, one that is expressed as a first responder, as a development partner, as a peacekeeper, a bridge builder, a global goods contributor, and an upholder of rules, norms, and law. It implies not only rebalancing in politics and economics, but in the cultural domain as well. It mandates the influencing of the international agenda and the shaping of global narratives. Not least, it means drawing on our own history and taking a long and deliberative view of the challenges that the world faces today. It requires us to be equally serious about the present, consolidating the achievements of the last decade while planning ahead for the quarter century of the Amrit Kal. Now, as you will all appreciate, it is but natural that a Bharat would approach the world from the perspectives of its own interests, worldview, sentiment, and culture. A crucial difference is that of not allowing our approach to be clouded by imported ideologies and global conformism. Instead, there is a self-assured analysis of how our national goals are best advanced, coupled with the experiences we share with others and the empathy that this generates. With that in mind, I put before you today 10 propositions 10 propositions that, to my mind, describe the current state of the world, and in each case, how Bharat would and should respond. So let us begin. First, there has been discernible, even if uneven, progress 
in economic and political rebalancing of the global order. The G20 has overtaken the G7, and many new groupings and mechanisms have come into being. The list of the top economies of the world has undergone change, and India itself has moved up six positions in the last decade. This change is real, but it is imperfect, and it is incomplete. It will continue to unfold, but not always in a linear fashion. While many objective conditions have improved from India's perspective, the struggle for cultural rebalancing has only just begun. To be conducted on a global stage, it must first be progressed at the domestic one. This battle is on. Economically, Bharat's answer is in greater Atmanirbhata, and politically, a more authentic and rooted representation that will contest the propaganda which will favor the compliant and the discredited. Bharat will never shy away from questions. But equally, Bharat has the courage to question the questioners. Second, even as these trends unfold, we have been subjected to decadal shocks. There is a backlash against globalization uh, and an assertion of identity and of autonomy. This is visible, for example, in the politics of the US and of the UK, and it continues to gather steam. It has been vastly aggravated by the trauma that COVID has inflicted on so many societies. And if you add to that the changes in Afghanistan, the fighting in Ukraine, the conflict in West Asia, each has its own lessons. Factor in as well, the implications of sharpening big power competition. The world now looks more volatile and uncertain, demanding independent and confident thinking from us. We have seen that already when it came to our energy procurement choices. Bharat chose the interests of its domestic consumers by resisting external pressures. Similarly, by questioning widely prevalent globalization mantras. We stood up for our workforce, we stood up for our SMEs and industry against unfair competition. Third, in such a world, the calculus of national security has understandably become much more complicated. Traditional methods of competing and pressurizing are buttressed by new tools of influence and disruption. Here, too, Bharat has pushed back with determination and fortitude. When we were challenged on the LAC with China in the midst of COVID, our rapid and effective counter deployments were the appropriate answer. Not just that, by seeking to rectify the long neglect of the border infrastructure, we have made the defense of the nation much more effective. On the larger stage, when it came to the Indo-Pacific, we held firmly to our decision to establish and take forward the Quad. On the Western Front, the long-standing challenge of cross-border terrorism now elicits more befitting responses. Believe me, Uri and Balakot send their own message. Fourth, economic security is no less demanding, is no less important the world today confronts the reality of massive over-concentrations created by misplaced globalization. The resulting leverage, leveraging the opaqueness and the distortions are key concerns not only of the international economy, but to global security as well. Unlike the past, Bharat does not accept that openness to the world justifies undermining level playing fields at home. On the contrary, it now seeks to build the deep national strengths where technology progress rests on the foundation of better manufacturing. Our goal is to participate in resilient and reliable global supply chains, especially when it comes to the industries of the future. The digital era, similarly, puts a premium on trust and transparency. There are good reasons why we have been prudent about certain games and apps in recent years. 
the compulsions of a more intensive decade also require us to prepare more seriously for a global workplace. Upgrading our skills, promoting talent and innovation, making it easier to do business, and supporting national products are all facets of the transformation underway. Fifth, the Global South today is strongly aggrieved at the treatment meted out to it. The COVID challenge showed how exposed it was to health vulnerabilities. Thereafter, the Ukraine conflict brought to the forefront its energy and food insecurity. In a world of rising debt, significant inflation, and trade disruptions, it is truly struggling to make ends meet. The regression in SDG progress and the fight for climate justice have become lightning rods. In this dire situation, Bharat serves as a voice of the Global South. Equally important, our achievements are a source of motivation. Whether it is the India stack or the Chandrayaan, the Covaxin or UPI, the Global South takes heart from the example of Bharat. I can testify from personal experience how interested the Global South is, is in our socio-economic delivery and good governance practices. Sixth, global conversations now in increasingly seek about an emerging multipolarity. The reality, however, is that preaching is not the same as practicing. After all, we also wit witness the advancement of hierarchical frameworks unilateral initiatives and attempts to restrict choices. A multipolar world must necessarily have a multipolar Asia at its center. Bharat will simultaneously pursue both goals since they are closely interlinked. And that pursuit is best done by insisting on mutual sensitivity, mutual respect, and mutual interest. It will insist on adherence to agreements and compliance with international law. Seventh, it is sad but true that multilateralism in the current era stands gridlocked. None of the major challenges of recent years have seen a collective and consensual response. Not just that, it is also a fact that global commons stands neglected and global issues are regularly shortchanged. The natural response is to press the cause of reformed multilateralism, particularly the reform of the UN Security Council. This is a subject of intricate and involved diplomacy, but at the same time must also be highlighted in public forums. The pressure for change is manifest and yet requires enormous effort to be brought to a tangible conclusion. In the meanwhile, our interests are best served by working with the like-minded and the convergent. In this decade alone, we have joined almost 40 different plurilateral groupings in different domains. For the foreseeable future, that apparently is the way forward. Eighth, even as the world changes, we must be cognizant of the reality that the old order coexists with the emerging trends. Managing a long twilight will be a very complex responsibility. And yet, it must be one undertaken with the requisite understanding and the dexterity. Bharat perceives the distinction between being non-West and anti-West. It is not our interest that in trading places, we end up with a more adverse situation. Finding common ground, even while asserting our own identity, is therefore an essential requirement. Ninth, a world of new balances is coming into being that features a repositioning of the U.S. and the rise of China, and amongst other developments. It is also one of sharper East-West polarization, currently focused on Ukraine, but not necessarily limited to it. At the same time, there is a deeper north-south divide revolving around concerns of development, debt, resources, and equity. 
we faced the entirety of these complications during our presidency of the G20. In response, we were not only able to achieve consensus, but also produced impactful outcomes on key issues. In doing so against such daunting odds, we were able to demonstrate that the quest to be a Vishwamitra has actually struck a chord with the international community. And finally, 10th, the global debate usually posits nationalism and internationalism as binary choices. Perhaps these are conclusions driven from the experiences of others. Bharat's story is very different. It is one of rejuvenation and resurgence at home, but more contribution and responsibilities abroad. Vaccine Maitri, International Solar Alliance, and a development partnership in 78 nations are proof of our commitment. So, where does, what does all this mean in practical terms when it comes to policy choices? Let's start with a better appreciation of our own history. As we have seen in the last decade, this then encourages us to develop deeper relationships with our immediate neighbors because they, we can build on shared interests and attributes. Where the extended neighborhoods, whether it is in South, Southeast Asia, where we have the Act East policy, or the Gulf, where we have Linkwest, or the Connect Central Asia, we are reviving long established linkages and associations. This is creating the basis for initiatives like the IMEC corridor and the I2U2. In the opposite direction, towards the east, a stronger recollection of our maritime history is driving the growth of the Quad and the exploration of the Chennai Vladivostok corridor. When it comes to tradition, let us not forget that there is a long one when it comes to statecraft in India. These include basic principles of how to engage neighbors and when and in what manner to incentivize and to disincentivize. Unfortunately, the compulsions of vote banks and a rosy-eyed view emanating from ideological predilections led to continuous misreading of some of our neighbors. Today, a more realistic approach that draws on experience ensures that our national security is served much better. The global image of all nations is significantly shaped by their culture. If we are defensive about ours, this naturally extrapolates into how we project ourselves or indeed how others see us. It is the transformations underway at home that has enabled us to take initiatives such as the International Day of Yoga, the propagation of uh, Ayush, Ayurveda, or the advocacy of millets. Uh -huh. In fact, this very confidence uh -huh. also makes the requests of our communities abroad, including for places of worship, more tenable. International cooperation may be a relatively modern concept, but Vasudeva Kutumbakam has existed as an outlook for centuries. Such beliefs have led us to offer vaccines to almost a hundred nations while we were still in the midst of vaccinating our own. Believe me, that memory will stay with them for a long time. It is also the driver of more than 600 development projects spread across multiple geographies that have been executed more efficiently due to our improved capacities. In fact, our progress at home has become key to conversations abroad, given that so many partners seek to profit from our example. If we are today a more people-centric polity, that too is very visibly reflected in our foreign policy actions. When COVID happened, our Vande Bharat mission brought back home millions of Indians stranded abroad. When conflicts took place in Ukraine, Sudan or Israel are special operations that also involved military assets ensured the safe return of our nationals. Even as a routine, the extensive use of Indian Community Welfare Fund 
ensures that Indians in need are never abandoned. And on the home front, as some of you may have personally experienced, obtaining passports has become so much easier. The message to our citizens is very clear. We have your back even when you go abroad. Bharat is understandably the source of greater ideas and initiatives. The world has seen that from a range of issues, whether it is solar energy and disaster resilience to sustainable lifestyle, counter-terrorism and oceanic welfare. If there is a single example of what has changed, it could be in the handling, it could be seen in the handling of our G20 presidency. By organizing it over 60 cities, we were able to project our enormous diversity to the world. We took up causes which were just and fair, amplifying the voice of the Global South and ensuring the entry of the African Union into the G20. The key outcomes, SDG Action Plan, Digital Public Infrastructure, Green Development Pact, the reform of international financial institutions, the principles of the Life Initiative or women-led development. All these together brought the international agenda back on track, successfully harmonizing East-West divergences and bridging the North-South divide demonstrated that a Vishwamitra can indeed make a difference. Today, a civilizational state is once again making its presence felt in the Committee of Nations. It brings to bear its particular experiences, outlook and approach to world affairs. This will have a stabilizing impact on an order that is currently marked by volatility and uncertainty. It will certainly help define the emergence of multipolarity. The international community can see that Bharat means confidence, it means equity, it means responsibility, and it means contribution. Our rise is being welcomed by many, and we must live up to global expectations, as we should do to domestic ones in the Amrit Kaal. Thank you for your attention.